I'm Richard Jefferson, and here's what we got in store for you today. It was a Hall of Fame weekend, and we'll discuss our favorite moments, and Mark Spears is here to give us a recap. Trey Young got booed by MSG fans again. How much better can he get as he approaches year four? And the Raptors are clear to return home. So we'll show you their top six plays in the six. So be like DK Metcalf and throw on your best bit because the jump starts now. Really, how do I get one of those outfits? I, I need that. I need that full outfit. I need that. How do I get that? Welcome to the jump. We'll have Ramona Shelburne, Tim Bontemps, Mark Spears, and Monica McNutt stopping by throughout the show. But first, let's start with the 2021 Hall of Fame class. Paul Pierce, who was a 10-time All-Star and won Finals MVP in 2008, became the latest in the long list of Boston Celtics in the Hall of Fame. Then we had Ben Wallace, best known for winning Defensive Player of the Year four times, is now a Hall of Famer despite being undrafted after college. And Chris Webber, the five-time All-Star, finally got his call to the Hall. C. Webb was a part of the Fab Five at Michigan, and his jersey is retired in Sacramento. And then we had Bill Russell, the big man. He entered into the Hall of Fame again, this time as a head coach. He's the fifth person inducted as both a player and a coach. And the two-time NBA champ, Chris Bosh, entered the Hall of Fame this weekend also. He actually had three championships rings in his possession until this weekend, but I'll let him explain that. When I met Pat during free agency uh, in 2010, he pulled out every trick, you know, and it was quite the performance. And as I was starting to stand up to leave from the meeting, he pulled out one last trick. Um, he took out this velvet bag full of championship rings and dumped them all across the table and he picked one up you know and he looked me dead in my eye and he said you give it back to me when we win one together now when i think about it it was crazy because i hadn't even agreed to sign with miami but that's pat you know and we did win a ring together two of them uh, but I never gave back the one he loaned me because, you know, for whatever reason, I wanted to wait till the right moment. And, you know, I figured this would be a good moment. And that's what the Hall of Fame is about. These amazing stories. Here are some other notable Hall of Famers from this class. Former Bulls forward Tony Kukoc and Villanova coach Jay Wright were among those honored. We're going to talk a little bit more about Lauren Jackson and Yolanda Griffith later in the show. But right now, I am joined by Ramona Shelburne and Tim Bontemps. Ramona, you've seen all the speeches. You watched the show. What was your favorite speech from this weekend? You know what? Chris Bosh really touched me with his speech. Not just the, the theatrical gesture of him say, you know, giving Pat Riley the ring back. There's a whole story with Pat Riley's rings. They were lost, and then he had them redone. He had them in the bag, and they were, they were too nice and new, so he had to, like, nick them up <laughs> <laughs> to make them look like they've been used. Um, so I think the, the ring that Pat gave Chris was redone, uh, was one of those redone rings. Yeah. Uh, but if you have 10 rings like Pat Riley does, that's how you go without... You give somebody a ring, you can like be without it for over a decade and then not even realize that he still had it. That's pretty awesome. But I love what Chris Bosch said about his career where at the age of 31, he gets these, this blood clot disorder and he just has to stop. And I remember covering this at the time. It was so hard for all of us who knew Chris, who knew how much he loved playing, who, who he obviously wanted to continue playing, but he had five kids. And you have to think about the rest of your life and the way that he has reinvented himself and found meaning in the rest of in what he does now. Um, I thought that was really powerful in, in the way he spoke about it. Yeah, I mean, I'm partial to Paul Pierce. Everybody on the jump knows Paul well. <laughs> yeah. He's one of the first guys that I actually covered that went in the Hall of Fame. I covered him with the Brooklyn Nets. And it was really neat to see him be on that stage and get honored that way. But to Ramona's point, you know, Chris Bosh is a guy that, you know, regular fans didn't get a chance to see as much because he played with Dwayne Wade and LeBron James and they took up so much of the spotlight. But for people that covered the league and our jobs, Chris Bosh was such a fascinating guy to talk to because he was always honest. He was always open about what was going on. He talked about the struggles he had adjusting to being the third guy in Miami and everything that went into that. And I think in that speech, in addition to him giving Pat that ring, you really saw the kind of person that Chris was and the really interesting, mm -hmm. thoughtful guy that he is. And I, I thought that really shone through in a way that I think regular fans might not have got a chance to see during the course of his career. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. That The funny thing about all of these Hall of Fame speeches is that you know everyone deserves to be there. You know that everyone has this unique story that you can make a, a, a movie over. You got Ben Wallace, you got Chris Webber that was long overdue, Ben Wallace undrafted, Chris Bosh who ended up having a medical condition that forced him to retire. So many great deserving individuals Yo. in the Hall of Fame. I know, we're gonna, we're gonna get to those, those lovely ladies, but my thing about Chris Bosh is that it's such a unique story because his career was cut at 31. Mm -hmm. At 31 years old, he is still in his prime. So to be a 14-time All-Star, to be a two-time champ, and to just be saying that, hey, you got to walk away. This this is over for you. I, I think to see how he's kind of redefined and, find, and found happiness, I think that's something that was really, really special. But we have some other stuff that was probably kind of fixed over and, and glossed over a little bit. The rift between Ray Allen and the 2008 Celtics is very well documented. But this weekend, Paul Pierce said this. We're always going to be brothers. Now, that's a big, big statement. Tim, do you sense, like you see, this wasn't some long speech. This wasn't any like, hey, we're going to rekindle right. this romance. But Tim, do you get the sense that this stalemate between the, the 2008 Celtics and Ray will kind of end soon? I certainly hope so, Richard. And, and this is something that Paul talked about in an article in Sports Illustrated that my pal Chris Mannix wrote last week. And he talked about the fact that at times Kevin Garnett has been, you know, pretty against having this rift come to an end and some of the other guys involved have been a little standoffish about it, but that Paul Pierce is determined to make this happen. And I think Paul's going to eventually get this done. I mean, that, that starting five from that Boston Celtics team, you know, here in the city of uh, Boston, they're still lauded for having never lost a series together. You know, obviously Kendrick Perkins famously hurt his knee right before game seven of that series of 2010 uh, against the Lakers the year before Kevin got hurt and they just never got a chance to really fully re go after a repeat like they did when they were healthy in 2008. And I think at some point you're going to see them all on the court here together in Boston, uh, celebrated. Hopefully Ray's jersey at some point goes up into the rafters. You know, they're doing Kevin Garnett's jersey retirement this year. Maybe that's a moment they can get everybody back there. Um, you saw Ray on the stage with Chris Bosh in Springfield this weekend. You know, it would, it would be really good, I think, and I think will eventually happen that you get that group together and celebrate what is the last championship here in Boston. One question. Is he on the group text? They have a group text from that team that has been going for years, for decades. It's, all you got to do is add them to it. Well, I know it's really yeah, hard to add people to a group text. Let me say I don't this, even know how to do it half the time. I have to start a whole new <laughs> As a player, let me tell you, like, the group text is sacred. Rule number one of the group text, I know. don't talk about the group text. <laughs> and then, like, who is on it? There, there is no addition to it. It's either you are on or you aren't. And my thing about the whole Ray Allen beef, sometimes players are still just looking for, even myself, we're still looking for some reason to be mad, to be competitive, to you? be grumpy. Yes, I'm still am. I'm still still a grumpy player but I just think <laughs> the reason why this isn't dying is because there's probably just there's it's, it's probably more fun we probably won't talk about it nearly as much if they're all best friends we'll just move on so at least this way you get a little bit more attention but we're going to move on to the Celtics rival and we're going to talk about the Lakers who traded Marcus Gasol in a 2021 uh, second round pick and 250k in cash to Memphis on Friday Ramona what more can you tell us about this deal Look, the Lakers could have used Marcus Gasol this year. And, and I think this is one of those trades and one of those situations where you look back on the reasons they signed him in the first place, like a couple summers ago, it's because they thought they needed more shooting in that starting lineup around LeBron James, now especially around Russell Westbrook, if he's going to be in the starting lineup, of course. Um, and they could have used him as a starting center, but he showed up to camp last year he wasn't as in shape as he should have been it took him a while to find his way with the lakers and when they went out and got andre drummond to essentially replace him because he wasn't giving them what they signed him for and what he needed that really lit a fire into him and then he became the guy that they wanted yeah and so by the end of the year i think everyone felt like oh well this is the marcus Gasol that they wanted the entire time i i I think the Lakers were hoping there was a way to bridge this stalemate here, but if Mark doesn't didn't feel comfortable being there, then he was going to stay in Spain and and perhaps play with his uh, his, his old Spanish club like he like his brother did last year. But they could have used him, and I guess as a consolation point, prize they save ten million dollars. Well, let, let, let's also let's also really quickly if he stays with Memphis and they waive him, then ultimately oh, that was the, him. The, I know, I'm just yeah. saying when they waive him, when it does happen, that is what. That was his team. That is going to be where his jersey yeah. is retired. Uh, you saw that with Zach Randolph is going to have his jersey retired uh, this year. Tim, what can you tell us about it? 
Yeah, I mean, look, it will be a nice story, Richard, for his last stop in the NBA to officially be with Memphis. You know, that is a nice bookend. Like you said, it is the place where he made his name, even though he won a title with the Raptors. But to Ramona's point, when the when the Lakers signed DeAndre Jordan, it was pretty clear where this was headed. They weren't going to have DeAndre Jordan and Dwight, Dwight Howard, Howard and Marcus All and Anthony Davis all on the same team all playing at center, trying to make that work. So it makes sense that they now move on from Marcus All, let him stay in Spain and have this team the way it is now. But to Ramona's point, Marcus All was better than Andre Drummond in the playoffs last year. He is a guy that fits where the Lakers need to be in the playoffs more than, in my opinion, DeAndre Jordan and even Dwight Howard does. I do think this could be a loss for them down the road, even though he's older, even though he's not quite as agile as he used to be. He still knows how to play. Mm -hmm. He's still an excellent passer. He still can be a uh, factor as a spot-up shooter, and he still knows how to be where he needs to on defense. That's the kind of stuff that I don't know if DeAndre Jordan is going to provide. I don't know if Dwight Howard is going to provide. Something we're going to see if the Lakers are able to manage it throughout the course of the season. Yeah, well, I, look, I, the thing about the Dwight Howard, we saw how impactful he yep. was on that 2020 run. And so you bring in Mark and you're like, okay, maybe Drummond can fill that Dwight Howard, you know, just big man. It didn't work. It didn't work when you brought him in. So now you bring Dwight Howard back, but you also add DeAndre Jordan, who really and truly is a carbon copy. So you're not getting anything different. The one thing that you uh, are able to get is you're able to get some continuity. So the same offense you're running with Dwight Howard running down the middle of that paint and and pulling in uh, the defense, then you're going to get the same thing with Drummond, who you know shot a career best last year on a lot fewer attempts, a lot fewer minutes. But you can see that athleticism. You can't teach tall and you can't teach a 40 inch vertical. And Dwight Howard and and DeAndre Jordan are still two of the most athletic big men that are out. But coming up, Trey Young. Uh, okay. So you dropped Sue Bird. Oh, man. And it was crazy. Oh, and I'm sorry to do the legend like that. She reached for it, and I just, you know, put it through my legs. And sorry, Sue. Oh. It's time for make or miss. Make oh. breaks. Here's what Erica Wheeler was talking about, this oh. nasty step back oh. on Sue Bird and sends her to the hardwood. Ramona, oh, is it Sue. weird to see a superhuman like like uh, like Sue Bird just oh. on the floor That's like, like that? like a face plant right there. Ooh, she's okay. I mean, He's like, is she okay? <laughs> I'm like, is she okay? I got to stick up for Sue, man. That's <laughs> No, Sue's won five gold medals. She, she, yeah, she, she has have dished to this out it, it for two like decades. It almost looks like she's on a shoelace or something. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her a little crush. She's laughing. She's fine. Okay. Yeah, she looks fine. I just want to hear about Richard's <laughs> moment like that in his career. When, oh, when, when was your ooh. moment like that, man? I, when did been, that happen? I, I been, did it. I've been dunked on. I've been crossed over. I've had it yeah. all happen. But you know what? I don't have five gold medals like Sue Bird. <laughs> and championships. And, and championships yeah. and all this stuff. Make car insurance. <laughs> Over the weekend, Tyler Hero got mobbed for pictures and autograph. One fan was so excited they forgot to put their car in park and crash it into a wall. <laughs> Tim, have you ever uh, been so excited to get an autograph when you were younger? <laughs> I, I have never been that excited. I mean, if this made me remind me of a story of my dad was a kid delivering, I think, mail in his neighborhood, and they left a car in neutral and rode down a hill and ran into something. Because uh, oh, that was my thought. How cool does Tyler was just, Hero look, though? Well, every, he and looks got great. He's got at night. I mean, my favorite part about this was everybody just all of a sudden <laughs> all looking in unison, then immediately looking back at Tyler Hero. It was like a three second look at this car. Now we're just going to pay attention to this guy. We're not going to see how the car is, we're not going to see what's going on. Just we got to talk song to playing at the same hey, time. Hey, look, I mean, he's, he's a man of the people. We get it. I but guess. miss life lessons. <laughs> another summer camp, another NBA <laughs> star picking on a camper. <laughs> this time it's Jason Tatum, who actually has a history of this. Ramona, anyone like picking on little kids more than Tatum? Uh, Kobe would do that too. Kobe like picking on little kids. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I like it though. <laughs> like, Does Deuce even have a chance? Does Deuce even have no, a chance that this is how his dad is going to treat him? <laughs> Yeah, but this makes you tougher. I like it. Don't nothing for I mean, free in this life. It is it is just funny that we see this every summer with these kids coming to these camps. They're super excited to see the NBA players, and they just make fun of these kids routinely at these camps. I, I find it very entertaining. Hey, that kid went viral. Okay. Hey, the, yeah, the yeah. kid went viral. This is all you want. Oh, he's hey, with a setback for no. sure. <laughs> Gosh. Hey, his I mean, parents, his parents back, signed the waiver. It's back, fine. It's your fault anyway. Make yes, trolling, exactly. which I can't stand. Trey Young was brought out at WWE SmackDown, and guess what? MS Jicks, right? Paul Pierce, Hall of Fame player. Some of his biggest moments outside of winning the title are shoving it in the heart of MSGP. I, I think that the Knicks deserve respect. Anybody that disrespects the Knicks, they're going to have problems with me.
Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about Trey. Keep it together. Keep it together. Right. Let's talk a little bit more about Trey Young. He's about to head into his fourth year, and last season he added conference finals appearance to his already impressive resume. He's been an all-star, but it was his first round series versus the Knicks that felt like his coming out party. Now let's take a look at his career numbers. Ramona, he turns 23 this weekend. How much better can Trey Young get? I think he would tell you the same thing, is that he just needs to improve on defense and be more consistent about it. Um, he played a lot more in the playoffs where those numbers look better in, in, in terms of his shooting and all that. But he his career defensive rating is 116. That's not so great. Okay? That's not great, yeah. And he would tell you the same thing. He he can be a better defensive player. And in that series, Tim, I think you were covering that series. To, uh, he, was not, he was not the black hole that people – talk about Trey Young on defense like they found a way to mitigate the the whole of Trey Young on defense and, and you have to give him a lot of credit for that too because he like he the comp to Steph Curry is this is where it really comes in here is Trey Young is even smaller than Steph Curry but there's a way that where you as long as you're not a negative on defense then that the Hawks can really go places well, and even less than being not a negative, Ramona, he just can't be awful, right? right. To your point. I mean, Trey's never going to be a defensive dynamo, given his size at that end of the court. He just can't be a guy that you could completely take apart at that end of the court. And throughout the playoffs, teams tried to go after yeah. him. And people were saying, why aren't, the, why aren't people attacking Trey Young more? A, Nate McMillan did a good job of hiding him. And B, Trey did a better job of putting an effort at that end of the court. Yep. And the funny thing is, like, you talk about Trey's game, how much better can he get? I'm not sure how much better he can get, but that's to me a testament to how good he was coming into the league because this is a guy who walked into the league drawing fouls like a 10-year vet, getting to the line all the time. He's got one of the best floaters in the league. He's a great long-range shooter, so he can get stronger. He can get better on defense. He can get a little better finishing at the rim, but he was so advanced coming in as a young guard that I think he was close to his ceiling, much closer to his ceiling than most young guards are just because of how advanced his overall game was. Well, and when you look back in history, you look at Allen Iverson, you look at uh, Steph Curry, and you look at these kind of smaller, thinner guards that are dynamic on the offensive end. you got to find ways to surround them. When, when Allen Iverson had one of his best seasons, he was surrounded by defensive players. Dikembe yep. Mutombo, Aaron McKee, they were just loaded on the defensive end. Steph Curry, they surround him with great defensive yep. players. And that's one of the things, like, yes, this might be a, a, a small area of weakness, even though Trey can get better, but if we surround them with high level defensive players that will kind of close in those gaps then I think the Atlanta Hawks start looking very very interesting I don't know if they have enough to get to the finals and win a championship and an they're overall right there, though. they're right but that's what I'm saying they're right there I could see them in the Eastern Conference Finals again but the one thing that Trey has when we talk about his defense when we talk about his percentage can he get better he has the it factor he just doesn't run away from the moment. He looks for yep. those moments. He finds the crowd. He looks and does anything he can because he embraces it. And I think very few players, especially this young, know how to walk the walk, talk the talk, and then back it up. And I think that's where Trey is light, hair, light years ahead of probably anybody, you know, five or six years uh, in this league. But coming up on the jump. The, the Hall of Fame weekend is our senior writer from the undefeated who was there, Mark Spears. How you doing, Mark? What's up, host or captain? What, what, what should I call you, man? Man, just call me Richard for right now, man. That, that, that's <laughs> Richard. What up, Rich? Uh, yeah, can, what's up, Rich? Uh, that's dope, man. man. It's dope. Thanks. You were just interviewing CP, so you weren't able to be here. But can you describe the respect that the current Hall of Famers have for Bill Russell this weekend? Yeah, I had a chance to visit with Paul Pierce and RJ, he showed me this picture, and it was him and Kevin Garnett and Ben Wallace and Chris Webber. And these, these are some guys that could talk now. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of opinions. And you see in this picture, they were focused on Bill Russell. And Paul told me that they spoke to him for over an hour uh, with Bill talking about the history of basketball, what he endured, and also just the kind of athlete he was. Ben Wallace was telling me that he was this great high jumper and long jumper, and he used to high jump jumping forward like Superman uh -huh. over the pole and actually showed him a picture of it. But they were just like in awe of just any time that they got with this icon and and uh, really remembered it strongly as, as you see now where he certainly get a lot older and doesn't get around as well.
And, and OK, so you talked about the history of basketball. You spoke with Spencer Haywood, who you wrote a yeah. book on. It's called the Spencer Haywood, uh, the Spencer Haywood rule. And if you are a basketball head, if you love the history of basketball, you have to read this book and you have to you. know who Spencer Haywood is. He is a pivotal person in the game of basketball. You know, he helped Bill Russell up on the stage this weekend. Yeah. What did Spencer share with you? Well, one, Spencer hopes that we he gets bigger recognition from the NBA about fighting the Supreme Court for free agency. But he also said it was surreal being on that on that stage. He's known Bill Russell for a long time. And, you know, obviously you got to respect this time with him getting older. And uh, he, he had to use a, um, a video instead of speaking himself. And, you know, Bill Russell, we love, would be speaking up there, have that cackle laugh and tell us some great stories. Mm -hmm. So he also said that on Friday night when Bill Russell was inducted uh, or got his jacket for going into the Hall of Fame for the second time as a coach, he said, wow, all these people are clapping for me. Like he still has a lot of humility and, and, and appreciation for people loving what he's mm -hmm. been doing since the 50s yeah. on and off the court. Yeah, and you know, it's amazing because the fact that it's kind of taken this long to get in as a coach, because when you look at it, you know, he was doing things and won a championship as a coach a long time ago. So, you know, this is this is well deserved. But the I, first black coach, I, I, you know, I was just teeing you up waiting. You know, those, yeah, those yeah. lobs finished themselves. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking no, with he, I mean, he was the first black coach, Red mm -hmm. Arback, you know, gave him that opportunity. And, and I think in a lot of ways with the 75th anniversary, we got to start giving the Celtics some respect. People like to beat up on Boston and talk about the racism there, but the Celtics were the first one to have a black star, first one to draft a player in Chuck Cooper, first to have an all-black starting five. They've had several black head coaches. Uh, Bill Russell was a superstar, perhaps the first black superstar in this league. So when you look at the black history of this league over 75 years, there is no franchise that has had a stronger impact on this league than the Boston Celtics and Bill and, Russell. Yeah, and then there is conversation about, you know, the, the town of Boston, but the fact that the organization of the yes. Boston Celtics has done all of these things lets you know that they were really kind of, you know, at the forefront uh, of social justice even back in the 50s. But I want to stick with the Celtics. Let's get to their 2008 championship squad, which we're yeah. still talking about. Ray Allen, Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett were all at the festivities this weekend. Did you see any interaction between Ray Allen and his former Celtics teammates. Well, uh, I, I did see some uh, between him and Paul Pierce, and, and they've been fine, and they've buried the hatchet a long time ago. Uh, Kevin Garnett, I believe, left as soon as Paul was finished. Now, whether they interacted with Ray collectively uh, during the ceremony, I have no idea. But somebody close to these three guys said that they hate that this has become some kind of almost like a black on black crime thing. They, they don't like that they, they've been pitted against each other. And I hope that when Kevin Garnett goes into the hall of, I guess the Celtics next year and gets his jersey retired, that Ray is there. I, I remember being back in Italy when they first got together and they're standing at the Coliseum, this beautiful picture of them together. And they, neither one of them win that championship in 2008 without each other. It was sad that Ray Allen wasn't at Paul Pierce's uh, uh, jersey uh, ceremony. And it would be sad if he's not at Kevin Barnett. So I hope that they figure out a way to bury the hatchet. You know, Bob Dandridge said, you know, after all these years going to the Hall of Fame, there's a lot of grudges that he let go. This is certainly one I think they need to let go. And uh, I, I like to see Ray Allen get back into the family uh, the way that he deserves to be uh, in that family and get his jersey retired as well. He was very instrumental in that championship, very instrumental in the fabric of Celtics basketball. And, and I hate that this, uh, this rift has lasted this long for these three amazing superstar icons for the Celtics. No, I, I agree. It's a tough one. But let's get to something that was probably on the positive side of the emotional side of, uh, of the Hall of Fame. Ben Wallace. He was so yeah. emotional during his speech, an undrafted player. I lost to him in, in, on their way to winning their, their one championship uh, in, uh, in Detroit. It was just a special, special team. What can you tell me about what you saw from Ben Wallace this weekend? Well, I was uh, blessed to host the press conference on Friday and Ben came up to me in tears 
and and gave me a hug before I was even able to ask him a question. A lot of people may have missed that press conference. If you could go back, go listen to what Ben Wallace has said, especially if you're from an impoverished, tough situation and you need some words of wisdom, he was gold. Mm -hmm. and, and I think at the ceremony, he, he was very poetic, very deep. Maybe it went over a lot of people's heads and a lot of people don't know, Ben actually came back on stage and spoke again for another 45 seconds. And I, I think he would wanted to give something a bigger meaning than basketball. And hopefully with his words, there were some people inspired because I know uh, being from Whitehall, Alabama, not having shoes when he was a kid, being having to shoot his for his own dinner and fish for his own dinner. Like Ben through a, went through a lot. He told me there was no kid in America that had it tougher than him. So I think in Ben's mind, uh, he wanted to use this weekend to talk about uh, rising from the ashes, rising from tough supers, uh, circumstances rather than just talking about basketball. Yeah, well, Mark, thank you so much for stopping by. I cannot wait to hear about your CP interview. But <laughs> we've got some good Raptor news later in this segment. But first, here are the top six Raptor plays ever in the six. Oh, oh my God, D Stodd, bear down. Gosh, I was going to say Arizona, Mighty Mouse. Baby. Mighty Mouse. Look, best best moment of my life, Michael Jordan at his basketball oh. camp. All the kids were asking him who was the toughest guy to guard. He literally said Damon Stoudemire because oh. all of the big guards had to guard Mighty Mouse. He didn't want any of that action. And then in 1999, Tracy McGrady from the free throw just yeah, inside. Step inside. But okay. it's so good. But look, you know, it's, it's game play. Oh, it's game I've seen play. Richard Jefferson do that yeah. before. When someone starts stutter stepping at the free throw line, yeah. you're <laughs> at the half court line, you're in trouble. Just get out the way. Yeah, they had both of those guys. <laughs> and in 99, Vince Carter with his first ever NBA 360 dunk. That's a reverse 360. And that was the thing. Yeah. He was the first one to really do it the That's opposite ridiculous. way. And then everyone else started doing, but you were like, Vince, why why do you twist that? What I, I just didn't understand. That's harder. That's harder. And then DeMar DeRozan over my guy, Timothy Mozgov. I'm sorry, Mozzie. You know I love him, 2016 champion. But today He did contest. But today it was all about this. That one leg bionic. That's boy. an underrated dunk. That DeMar dunk yeah. on Mozgov's a really underrated all-time dunk. And then in 2016, first round of the playoffs, Kyle Lowry's prayers are answered. Oh, Gosh, they used to just make it so much fun in that building. So much fun. And now he plays Hi, for the Heat. This, this is why they're like, we need you on our side. But we all know what the number one is. I was waiting for it. We all know what the easy. number one is. Uh, 2019, Kawhi Leonard sends the 76 The bounce of God. Home. Just, in, just an incredible shot. There's a really cool mural at uh, at the Pearson Airport in Toronto with that shot right in that moment before it goes in. Um, it's an, just an incredible picture. There's Nick Nurse. To this day, that is still the most most emotion we've ever seen to, from Kawhi. If you combined all of his emotions before that, combined in once, that's still more. I'm back with Tim Bontemps and Ramona Schoburn. The reason why we counted down the Raptors' top plays at home is because they are back in the Air Canada Center Ooh. next season. So, Tim, you've been around this team. How much of an impact do you expect this return to make for the Raptors? Massive. Absolutely massive. And I think people are really underselling the Raptors going into this season. If you're looking at over-unders for this season, I think the Raptors over is going to be, if not a lock, something really close to it. Because this team was a 50-win team yep. several years before that. And I know they lost Kyle Lowry, but they have everybody else back from that team. And they go back home after being away for basically the past 18 months. And they've got Pascal Siakam. They've got Fred Van Vliet. They've got OG Ananobi. They've got one of the best coaches in the league in Nick Nurse. I got Gary Trent Jr. is a nice pickup for them. I think this Raptors team is going to be really good and tough in the East. And I think they're going to be right back in the same ballpark that they were before fighting to be somewhere in the middle of the pack in the Eastern Conference playoff race. I don't think people talked enough about how disadvantaged the Raptors were being in Tampa last year. And, and this is not an offense to the city of Tampa, but when they decided to go there, the, uh, the thought was, okay, the Canadian snowbirds, uh, when they go there for the winter, the people in New York, or people in Toronto, they, a lot of times for the winter you go down to Florida and you, you, where it's warm. Well, they couldn't travel down there. They thought they would have a natural fan base from some of the Canadian snowbirds who would go down. They, how many it didn't happen. How many Canadian snowbirds are in Tampa? A lot. Okay, they go to Florida. Look, look, 
I live in Arizona, and I know that there's not that many snowbirds there. But <laughs> they thought they were going to have a home crowd there in Tampa last year, Richard. And, the, and most of the time, it was a bunch of fans for the other team. So you're basically playing a whole bunch of road games and then home road games with the opposing fans. I mean, it was very tough for them. They lived the entire time. They set up shop in a Marriott down there. They converted some conference rooms into practice courts. Some of the players were able to rent houses, coaches. But for the support staff who have families, they had to just move to Tampa, and some of them left their families in Toronto because you couldn't go back and forth across the border. The border was closed. This was really a disadvantage for the Raptors last year, and I don't think there was any team that suffered more from the restrictions last year than the Toronto Raptors. Not to mention they had a giant COVID outbreak where they got all the way up in the middle of the uh, the standings. By the time that COVID outbreak was over, they were in the lottery. And we Yeah, so I was going to say they were two and eight. They had a terrible start. They lost two or three one point games and see Pascal Siakam had shots bounce out at the buzzer. They get back to 500, they're 17 and 17, and then their entire coaching staff gets COVID, and then half the team gets COVID. And their season just went off a cliff after that. So yeah, I I think the Raptors getting back home to Ramona's point, they were brutally impacted by COVID. I think they're going to be much, much better this year and right back, like I said, in the mix in the East. No, I agree. As players, we talk so much about our routine. Our routine is our restaurant. Mm-hmm. It's our family. It's our home. It's it's your drive to practice. It's your drive to the games. Like that is a much, that's as much a part of your success as anything because you have continuity. You have consistency. And so when you have all these guys going down to Tampa, and they're all just kind of in just like a, a stopgap place. A hotel. A, a hotel. You know yeah. it's not. It's not. And we're not even adding into the extra COVID precautions that you're having to take and all of the different things that went into last season and making it very difficult. But I think this Toronto Raptors team, and everybody knows Toronto is one of the top five NBA cities when it comes to fan base and just environment. So I know they are excited to be back there. Ramona. Thank you so much for joining us today. Coming up, Brianna Stewart is... And you, you know, if, if there was a guy from Arizona on the other team, even if you didn't play with him, even if you didn't know him that well, you just automatically felt that connection. Same connection that we all feel here. I think about the impact he had on my life. He changed my entire life, the entire course of my life, everything he's done for me. And I think about everybody here who would say the same thing. And ultimately, that's his greatest accomplishment, is bringing all of us together, creating this family. What an amazing family to be part of. He included all of us. You guys included all of us. We love you. Love you, coach. Thank you. That was Steve Kerr talking about Coach Lute Olson. I wanted to add a few words about Coach O. I could talk about his five Final Fours, his 23 straight tournament appearances. I can even talk about over a 17-year stretch that his Arizona Wildcats had the nation's best winning percentage. I could talk about his coaching tree that includes Steve Kerr, Luke Walding, the defending champion Bucks head coach Mike Budenholzer. But Lute Olson was so much more than that. What have he accomplished on the court? He was a great man. He was a great teacher and a molder of young men and minds. I was 10 years old living in Arizona in 1990 when Coach O stood up to the state and recognized Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. He had all of his players wear an MLK patch on their warmups before the game to protest them not having the holiday. So even 30 years ago, he was teaching young athletes to use their platform and to not shut up and dribble. His legacy is forever cemented on and off the court. The jump will be right.